Welcome to another data science deep dive on our technical track. In the following presentation, Nathan Burke, lead data science engineer at Salesforce, speaks about how model cards are increasingly becoming a standard transparency tool in the world of machine learning. The talk addresses how the model card standard has been implemented in Salesforce marketing cloud, Einstein. Enjoy. Hi, my name is Nathan Burke. I work for Salesforce. I've been there for three years as a data science engineer. I build AI and machine learning products in marketing and advertising professionals. It's part of Marketing Cloud Einstein. Today, I'd like to talk to you about model cards and how we apply this transparency standard, Salesforce Marketing Cloud Einstein. Applying the standard at Salesforce wasn't completely straightforward. So we're going to take a small detour, review how machine learning and AI software products work in a multi-tenant software as a service context. We'll finish with some of the benefits you might see if you choose to deploy model cards on your teams that you should learn. The term model card arose as part of a 2019 Google research paper. The paper was motivated by incidents wherein the deployment of predictive models resulted in outcomes that could be construed or understood as unfair or discriminatory. For example, this paper here cites examples where a facial recognition model does not work on faces of people of African or Asian descent. The purpose of model cards isn't to fix all the models, or to eliminate all discriminatory software, but rather to serve as a foundation for transparency, really a starting point. Model cards are used to clarify the intended use cases of machine learning models and document how they perform. To help understand this, Let's look for a second at this diagram of a conventional software product. Now, I know I'm glossing over plenty of opportunities for software QA jokes. The idea here is very simple. A piece of software has code, which admits a deterministic and documented set of behaviors in response to a known set of user actions. User does foo, you get bar. Otherwise, baz. The main thing to note here is that the behavior that user A sees, it's 100% dependent on what that user does, the interactions, and what code happens to be running at the time of that interaction. The behavior of other users has nothing to do with it. It doesn't directly impact the behavior that user A sees. There are only two things in the feedback loop. It's just the user and the code. In contrast to conventional software products, which usually behave in a small set of ways that can be fully documented, Software products built around machine learning and AI allow statistical properties of training data to determine the behavior of the product. This is why, for example, you might have heard some machine learning products, particularly eight to nine years ago, described as leveraging collective intelligence. Let's take a look at this diagram to understand the concept better. Now, there's one caveat here that I want to make clear. This is a grossly, grossly oversimplified example of a small slice of machine learning techniques. And it makes no effort to go into, for example, splitting your data into training and validation cohorts. 
or anything like that. That said, here, the user, user A, is part of a population of other users, some of which might not even be internal to the company deploying or using software. It is this training data from all of these users or individuals that can often determine the behavior of the product that user A sees. Note that my behavior arrow here is extending purposefully all the way inside the box to that crowd. And there's usually a lot of this training data, too much to exhaustively document as you would with conventional software products. Now, to be clear, the risk with AI software products is that it's the statistical properties of the training data, all those users inside that, and outside of that box, that influences the behavior. The crowd might induce unintended and unwanted behaviors for certain groups or factors of end users. As mentioned above, a facial recognition algorithm is trained only on a crowd of white people. It might have difficulty identifying faces, people of color. Purpose of the model card. We identify key characteristics about how the model was trained and deployed so that users can make informed decisions about how to use the model. It is an effort to get ahead of questions such as, what was the training data taken from? Was it, was it a representative population? Or how does the model behave against certain protected classes of individuals? Let's dive in a little bit deeper. This is the basic outline definition of a model card. Not all points are applicable to all models, but note that information about the intended use cases, evaluation factors, training data, and ethical considerations are included here. Note here that a factor is just a fancy word for a category of model subjects, people, groups of people or groups of entities against which the model will be evaluated when it is in use. The idea is that each one of these bullets should be filled out by the owner of the model and published, ideally publicly. So what are we talking about here? It's a document that answers the questions, what is the model, how should it be used, and given how it should be used, what groups of people has the model been evaluated and tested against to double check that it is not generating unfair outcomes? So now that we know the definition, let's talk a little bit about how all of this might apply in a business to business software as a service context. Now, in contrast to consumer facing companies like Google or Facebook to give their software away for free. Salesforce has a notion of a tenant at its heart. A tenant is a business to business customer that an instance of a Salesforce product is sold to. There is a basic guarantee of isolation of behavior and data for each one of our tenants, customers. You're never going to log into a Salesforce product and see some other customers' data. It's like the golden rule of software as a service. Never let that happen. Because of this, nearly all of our models are per tenant models, where there is one model trained per tenant. The model behavior that a tenant sees is wholly determined by that tenant's data, whereas a global model, like what you see with Google or Facebook most of the time, that lets data from all tenants or users impact the behavior of a single model that all tenants use. Each approach has its pros and cons. A somewhat contrived example of a global model would be Google search relevance rankings when you're not logged in at all on any Google product and have somehow scrubbed location data being sent from your phone to Google. Indeed, 
the original use case of model cards was aimed precisely at companies that deploy global models. The problem they are trying to solve is an inherent, really unavoidable side effect of the global model, where a tenant that is perhaps in an underrepresented minority of tenants in the training data, where that tenant sees behavior that is irrelevant or harmful to them because the behavior of the model is largely derived from training data that represents a majority. As a personal example, I am an avid classical music fan. And one of my favorite musicians is the Armenian violist, Kim Kashkashi. But whenever I type her name into Google, I always, always get a did you mean Kim Kardashian at the top of the page, even when I am logged in? This is because I happen to be in a, what is perhaps an underrepresented minority of search users that are interested in classical viola music relative to search users that want to keep up with Kim Kardashian and her family. When thinking through the idea of applying the model card standard at Salesforce Marketing Cloud, we were initially concerned that we would need to somehow generate one model card for each customer. At Salesforce Marketing Cloud Einstein, however, this is less of an issue since there is a high degree of isolation already baked into the per tenant model. While it was a bit tricky, is we needed to think carefully about what parts of the model card framework were applicable to our situation. We still found good reason to deploy model cards, transparency tool. Send time optimization is a Salesforce marketing cloud feature that uses AI to determine the optimal time at which to send an email to a given user optimize for that user's engagement. Where engagement here is clicking or opening that email. Now this model, it isn't overly complex. It only takes into account anonymized email open and click behaviors relative to sending patterns. We realized that one of the main reasons for creating model cards is to be open about what type of implicit bias is being built into a model by virtue of letting user data be a component of how the model behaves. In our case, we don't use any demographic data at all, not for training, evaluation, or at runtime. So while this largely made for a short and relatively concise model card, we found it extremely helpful still to think through why this was the case. Drafting and iterating and commenting on the model card was a great exercise in bringing product managers, designers, engineers, and data professionals to the same table to think about something really important, which is what is the high level impact of our system on our users? Not just how it works, the impact. I've included a link to our publicly available model card for send time optimization here in the slides. And here is what it looks like. You can click into any one of the components here and read about it yourself. For example, this is our section on ethical considerations. You'll note that we go and talk through the fact that we are not using demographic data in the model, but at the same time, we still surface a warning that the use of the software, you know, in a way that would be done differently against a vulnerable or disadvantaged segment of users would still result in those users being negatively impacted. Even though the data footprint of send time optimization is low, 
part of why we released a model card for the product was to increase transparency. Our sales team has been asking for the model card constantly since we published it. It is a fantastic resource to deploy in pre-sales due diligence processes. But more generally, releasing the model card has helped immensely with product trust. We've found that as AI has found its way into the workflows of marketers and advertising professionals, the number of questions we receive from customers about model behavior in model internals has exploded. There are simply more questions that are being asked by more customer stakeholders. And why is this? When you use or buy a software product built around AI, such as Salesforce Einstein, it can feel like hiring a new member of your team almost. As with any new hire, the resume is a key component of the hiring decision. We like to think of the model card, Salesforce Einstein's resume, tailored to the requirements of the position. I'd like to thank the Data Science Salon team, as well as the Salesforce Marketing Cloud Einstein team. I'd be happy to take questions now. That was Nathan Burke, lead data science engineer at Salesforce, who went into detail on addressing how the model card standard has been implemented in Salesforce Marketing Cloud Einstein products. If you'd like to watch more videos like this, you could subscribe to the DSS Insider program. The link is in the comments section. And you can also follow our channel by clicking below.